Hi, you're watching The Ian Khan Show. Today, you're watching a special episode. It's an Aftershock contributor series that features one of the world's top futurists. Today, I'm talking to Rick Sachs, MD. Hi, this is Ian Khan, and welcome to a new podcast series that's part of Aftershock, the recent book that's come out and has the world's top 50 futurists talking about the future of the world in different uh, in different topics, under different subjects. Today with me, I have one of the world's foremost futurists when it comes to medicine, when it comes to understanding the human condition in the, in the future, 5, 10, 20, 50 years from now. Please welcome Rick Sachs, MD, who's joining me today for this podcast. Rick, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ian. So Rick, I have so many questions for you and I, and, I, and I wish I could ask you all of these, but here's the book. We both are contributors to, to Aftershock. It's such an incredible volume of work that I really believe it's going to be there forever as an inspiration and as a learning tool uh, for generations to come. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Rick. What has brought you to this journey to this point in time here today now? So Ian, um, I'm a big believer that the future is grounded in what we're doing now. And so my views on the future come from my background. Uh, I'm a physician, I'm a cardiologist by training, but spent a, uh, having spent time in, intensive, in the intensive care setting, uh, taking care of patients with acute heart attacks and heart failure and other rather uh, dramatic manifestations of heart disease. Uh, I then m moved on to uh, try to pursue my interests in the pharmaceutical industry, initially developing drugs uh, for treatment and management of heart attacks uh, and other related cardiovascular disorders. Um, then of course, move, uh, moved on to become very interested in problems related to overall drug development. Uh, I, can, I would say that I'm an expert in large scale cardiovascular trials, but also an expert in how to develop drugs. And most importantly, how to get drugs from the discovery, from their discovery, the science, all the way to the market, out to patients. And you'll know, you'll know if you've looked at my chapter that I'm very, very, a very strong believer in patient centricity, the movement to really empower patients uh, to take charge of their own health care. I also have a background in philosophy and a background in bioethics. So however technology evolves, I also I tend to think a little bit about the ethical issues and, and uh, that, that uh, result from the technology. I don't think that technology uh, can be applied without understanding its impact on us as human beings and on, on the, the world that we live in. So that's kind of a little bit where I'm coming from. Excellent. So there's there's a few different things that you've touched upon that right there, Rick. First is the evolution of healthcare. How and where is healthcare going and where are patients going? It's also the evolution of, of disease and outbreaks. And today we're looking at something incredible in the coronavirus as, as a health mm -hmm. scare. And this is such a relevant um, uh, session today, and I'm looking forward to asking you your insights on that. We're living in an era where this outbreak actually was predicted in a movie where Matt Damon uh, acted in it, a few contagion or something, a few years ago, five or six or years ago. And that has actually happened exactly the way it was anticipated a few years ago. What exactly is happening? Do we already know these things are on the way and we shouldn't be surprised? I uh, actually touched a little bit on this in some of the opening uh, comments I made, uh, mostly to speak to the fact that we can't think of the world as our own little narrow uh, healthcare focus. We live in a global community and contagion or the most recent uh, epidemic of the coronavirus is a manifestation of, the, of our interconnectivity. What happened or what started perhaps with a biologic transmission from animal to human, I think this is still uh, you know, trying to be determined, but it, it is the mechanism behind SARS uh, and then also MERS, which were also coronaviruses, although on a much smaller scale. This, uh, this coronavirus appears to be far more contagious than either of those and therefore much more difficult to contain. But the, but the true story here is the fact, not only the, um, that the virus is, is more easily transmissible, but the interconnectivity of the world, starting in Wuhan and then moving around the world very rapidly. Singapore, a few cases now in the US, yep. a lot of people quarantined outside of Japan uh, and so on. 
disease will spread because of we're a world that travels, people move about, we are interconnected. Yeah, absolutely. And the 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 more interconnected the world is, we I think at a philosophical level, and this touches me most with an outbreak like this, is that you know, with technology, we're 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 all going into different, you know, um, let's say in our own small little corner and we you know we've got our cell phone and we're we're in our own world so we're kind of cutting off from the rest of the world however with an outbreak like this that's that's happening because people are traveling it's kind of affecting all of us so even though you're separating yourself from the world you're still connected to the rest of us it's such a it's such a you know uh, a yin yang situation and so i think one of the things that i wanted to ask you was the future of healthcare as these diseases break uh, or hopefully you know nothing bad happens in the world we're all hoping for that but reality is different with gmo foods with genetic mutations uh, crispr who knows what's coming up next there's so much possibility of things going wrong as a cardiologist as a doctor as a practicing um, medical practitioner what are your thoughts on where are we headed in terms of these new things affecting the purity of our DNA and affecting us uh, through disease, through mutations, through things we, we haven't seen before? Well, there's some definite trends that are manifest here and now that I think are going to have a long-term uh, effect on both individual healthcare and global healthcare. I think uh, on the one hand, the fact that we're experiencing a, a hasn't been announced yet, but essentially a global pandemic, uh, let's call it an emerging pandemic, uh, speaks to our interconnectivity as a biologic species on a global basis. That contrasts with what's happening, I think, in medicine, which is more and more focused on the individual as we get into the era of precision healthcare, as people understand their own genomic makeup, uh, their own environment, and, and how things like food and the microbiome begin to in, impact their immune system and even their moods and emotions. Um, how medicine and treatment of cancer is becoming very, very individualized. So you ha have medicine on the macro scale uh, as witnessed by the coronavirus uh, um, you know, uh, uh, spread, as, even as medicine focuses more and more on the tailored uh, treatment of the individual. And I think that those con contrasting uh, but interactive uh, dynamics in medicine are going to shape uh, how medicine evolves for the future. There, there are, by the way, real price tags around this too, because as medicine yeah. becomes more individualized, the question of who's gonna pay for what yeah. really comes to the fore. Yeah, absolutely. In, and there's such a huge divide in across the world when it comes to who pays for treatments, uh, whether it's the Medicare of the United States, the NHS, private healthcare. Uh, I believe almost 2 billion plus people in the world um, do not have access to primary healthcare as far as we know. It's, I think, 2.5 billion people don't have access to a toilet where they can relieve themselves. And that's Water. the state of the world. Toilet. Yeah. Simple, anti, you know, straightforward antibiotics, things that we take for granted every day. Absolutely. Now, in the book, in your article, and I really suggest everybody who's watching this uh, episode of the show or the show in general, buy a copy of Aftershock. It's available online. It's, uh, it's one of the best resources that you can have. Uh, and learn about the future in so many different ways. So please get the book. It's available on Amazon. I'm not sure what it's priced at, uh, but it's an incredible um, work that uh, John Schroeder has put together. You've written about Dr. Wither, and uh, it's about the doctors vanishing from the future. It's the, the role of doctors changing. Tell me about that. How is that going to happen? I, I, don't, I don't ever see, uh, and I think it would be a real uh, misinterpretation of what I, what I believe to say doctors will vanish. Doctors will evolve. Um, there is a primacy that has existed for eons around the physician, the physician as expert. And yet we're beginning to see the emergence of technology that is able to uh, embrace and compass certain more routine aspects of what physicians, um, physicians do. There was a recent publication of uh, an AI technology uh, supported by Google 
which is now uh, beginning to be able to predict uh, the, out, the, the results of mammograms with as high, if not slightly higher fidelity than a group of radiologists, better than a single radiologist, but be, as good, if not slightly better yep. than a group of radiologists. I don't think that the point is that the technology is going to replace the radiologist. The technology is go going to augment the skill of the radiologist. There's no substitute yet in the, in the AI world for the integrative thinking, thinking of the human mind and the ability to assess outliers, outliers and nuances. The AI uh, training sets are only as good as what's fed into them. But they can augment and sharpen uh, the skills of a physician and take care of a lot of the rote things. I think that when I talk about the physician wither, I'm thinking more about some of the routine things that physicians do that could be that they could empower patients to do with the right technology. Um, diagnosis of fairly routine colds, not coronavirus, but yeah, colds. Yeah. Um, telling a patient when they should contact the doctor as opposed to what sort of remedies they might try first. Figure out what something, whether something is an emergent situation or whether it can be managed in a, in a less emergent environment, thereby yep. decreasing emergency room visits. I don't see the doctor being replaced, but I do see the role of the doctor evolving. And as the technology gets more and more sophisticated, and we're talking 50 years out, not not tomorrow, as this gets more and more sophisticated, the patient should be able to take more and more um, self-direction in, in their own care, and yeah. doctors will evolve to become people that are really much better at spotting the exotic things, the new emerging viruses, the new diseases that we can't even predict now, and that's going to require specialization, but even as the more routine things get handled in a, in a much more cost-efficient and patient-centric way. Does that, does it, that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And I have a question on the two different or two different areas within medicine. One is internal medicine. It's, you know, prescribing medicines, figuring out disease, testing. It's all these things that require, that take time because of scale, because we need, uh, you know, to go through results manually, or we need to analyze a thousand results to figure out where disease is progressing. The other area that's of high interest uh, to me personally, is robotics. How much of robotics is coming into play into the medical industry, into, into surgeries that we can say, hey, in the future, and it's very common to hear this, hey, in the future, you know, robots will operate on you and you'll be, you know, it, everything's going to be okay. I have serious doubts about the evolution of robotics right now, that this would be possible in maybe the next two to five to even 10 or 15 to 20 years, where you walk into an operating theater, a bunch of robots takes you in, they perform surgery on you, and voila, you're good and gone. What are your thoughts on that? I, I agree with you. I've spent enough time um, immersed, literally, in some cases, in human anatomy, having spent time in an operating room or in the cardiology suites, to understand the infinite variation of human anatomy. And I don't think any training set that can be felt uh, taught to AI uh, in our current, under, uh, uh, current understanding of AI, which is based on machine learning and neural networks and things like that, is going to be any substitute to the vast uh, differences that exist from human to human uh, in, their, in their fundamental anatomy. So again, I look at the technology as augmenting the skill of, of the physician, not as replacing the skill of the physician. Yeah. Again, having said that, one could envision a, um, a future uh, evolution of AI that may become more sophisticated. But based on what we understand now, I look at this as augmenting the skill. And I think the robotics of today uh, are really focusing on augmenting the skill of the surgeon, not, not replacing it. I, I don't see that in anywhere in the near term future, and maybe not even in the next 50 years. Now, what about things such as nanobots and these small little, uh, ro you know, uh, things or capsules or tablets that you can swallow and in they go in our body and they'll fix things around. I see there's some of that happening already when it comes to diagnostics. Can you help us understand what is happening in the industry right now and what can we expect to see so in the future? Def definitely for di diagnostics and a little bit for therapeutics as well. One of the great concerns in some patient populations is that they are actually taking their drugs and taking them appropriately. And very simple technologies have been around e even 
for the last half a decade, not, not used widely, but available, that allow the tracking of pills, uh, the fact that a pill is uh, being taken in, uh, administered properly, uh, dosed, and so on and so forth. That technology uh, is, is very interesting for certain populations. But the ability to place micro delivery systems could change how therapies are done, and especially in areas where delivery of therapies can be quite difficult, such as, such as the brain, uh, blood-brain barrier where, where ther certain therapies can't cross it, uh, very specific placement into targeted areas of the, the brain so you don't uh, get a, a broader destruction ba based on the therapy. I think the nanotechnology is useful for that. Where it gets really interesting where, is where the nanotechnology can also have sensory technology built into it. So take a diabetic where you want to monitor glucose. If there was a technology available in implantable technology that can man manage ambient glucose levels and then make the appropriate adjustments uh, in insulin level, that could fundamentally change the dynamics of the treatment of diabetes. And technologies are already in progress here and now uh, to do that, I think they're going to become widely available over the next, you know, next decade or so. Excellent. And I'm hoping that with the uh, advent of so much AI and so many, so much investment that companies like Google and Microsoft and Alibaba are making into, uh, into putting more uh, effort into, you know, that scale that we need behind figuring out where the next outbreak is, I, I think society in general can benefit and people who do not have access to basic health care can somehow benefit as we're able to diagnose disease faster and, and do all of those things. We're, we're slowly approaching the end of our podcast. We still have oh, a few minutes. Much longer, I'm sure. <laughs> and I have tons of <laughs> questions for you. I want to ask you, I want to ask you about what advice would you give to healthcare practitioners who are in the field now, who are getting into the industry now they're studying in college and university becoming doctors of the future what would you, what advice would you give them about what should they do uh, about this tomorrow that they're they're going to be practicing in as as physicians as cardiologists like yourself uh, yeah. what's your advice great question um because it speaks to the um the training and development of, of the next generation i think the next generation is already here i think the uh, the the next generation of physicians already is understanding the critical importance of teamwork, the, the critical importance that they're not functioning as the sole imperious expert, but are in, in teams and they cannot function without um, engaging the entire healthcare ecosystem in the management of the patient. So teamwork, first and foremost, embrace the empowerment of the, of, of the, of the patient, uh, uh, Again, this is part of the, the, the current training of physicians, but it's going to get even more so as more technology uh, moves outwards and patients uh, begin to take even more, uh, um, more responsibility for their own care. And again, they'll be working within a, a team environment, I think often with a nurse uh, at the center of this. Um, one has to begin to think also about the emergence of telemedicine where the primary uh, environment might a, a blood drawing, you know, I might sit with a nurse and a doctor, maybe a doctor on tele, you know, available about through telemedicine because the communications of vital signs and blood results and stuff like that can, and, and even radiology images, even the patient's images, pictures of a rash could be transmitted to a television through through a tel television to a more centralized doctor, and that could benefit populations where healthcare is very remote. Uh, and, and not accessible at all because the ecosystem isn't there. So all of these things, teamwork, um, the, the emergence of technology that should be embraced, the centricity of the patient, I think all of those things are dynamics which the current physician needs to begin to understand and, and build into their way of thinking of how they practice. Absolutely. And I believe there's, there's so many different uh, innovative um, solutions and products that are coming to the market where, uh, and I just saw this one yesterday, I've seen it before, and it's a, it's a device that you attach to your iPhone or your smartphone, and now you have an ultrasound scanner. It's, it's just a very portable yeah. device that it, it literally looks like something like this, and you, it's an ultrasound scanner that's portable. I think it's a couple of hundred dollars. There's another one, which is a um, 
I believe an ECG monitor that you connect to your iPhone, you put your two fingers on it, yeah. and it gives you some something. It gives you something that you That's can. That's actually been and, around for a couple of years now, and uh, there's also now the uh, the Apple Watch, which can, uh, you know, which last year the latest version could actually record a pretty pretty good fidelity electrocardiogram. Um, without additional equipment, mostly for the detection of atrial fibrillation, and Apple was approved for that as a way of initially detecting it, atrial fibrillation. Note, though, to refer to a physician for further evaluation. Yeah. It's not a tool that's going to make a diagnosis on it uh, on its own yet. Yeah, yeah. And when you look at um, regions and places and countries where there's more rural areas, there's more remote areas. I mean, imagine the transformation that these small devices can make. You don't have to wait for 10 days or a weekend. I mean, people will have access to something that they've never had before. And I, I believe that's the power of um, innovation and technologies to bring all of this to people who have not had access to any of these facilities in the past. We really dynamically change our healthcare delivery infrastructure yeah. in ways that uh, right at the moment, our delivery infrastructure is very focused on, on you know, populations who have access to it. I think that will fundamentally change. I think the cost dynamics will change. I think the bureaucracy will significantly decrease. I think the impact may be less so on physicians, but by all the people that are required to manage a very inefficient healthcare bureaucracy currently, access will become broader. All of the things that you mentioned uh, will be enabled by technology. Absolutely. Rick, I wish we could talk forever, but I know you have to go and, and thank you so much for spending time with us and helping our viewers understand where to go, what to do. Tell us where our listeners can find you and find more information about you. Well, I think that the, the first thing is I'll do the same thing as you. Strongly recommend people read Aftershock. Uh, the wealth of, uh, of information and expertise and just issues to ponder in this book. I've just touched on a modicum with you of that to, to, with you today, and I hope that uh, you'll get more people on, on your podcast and, uh, and speak to, to other issues. But I can be reached through LinkedIn. Uh, that's probably the best, the easiest way to, to, to reach out and, and contact me. Uh, I have my own little consulting com company, Pharma Design Solutions uh, uh, Limited. Uh, you can reach me through that as well. Well, but I think LinkedIn is probably the easiest way to contact me. Amazing. Rick, thank you so much for sharing these insights with us. Thank we'll connect again. And uh, it's such a pleasure to have you on board. And I'm sure that, you know, Aftershock will, will, will continue creating um, a good um, shock, if you will, in, in, in the industry out there. But thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an Welcome. honor. You take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hey friend, this is Ian Khan. If you liked what you saw on my video, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh, updated, and ready for the future. For more information, also visit my website at iankhan.com.